Man, I'm excited to be here. Are you? Yeah. Amen. That's cool. That's cool. Listen, we started a series last week. It's entitled Greatest Moments, and it goes right along uh, with our mission statement where we're building on life's greatest moments, right? Leah mentioned earlier, uh, growing in relationship with God and each other. We, we believe here at this church what's really worked for us, that our worship and, and our affection to God is balanced when we're loving God, loving people, and loving life together. And so I just felt like God was moving in my heart to kind of position us, if you will, in that statement and really grow from it. So um, last week we kind of started this out with the idea of being born again because we had gone through the Easter season, we'd gone through those messages and, and, and we got to see the creativity of the day, but we really didn't talk about you know, the real meat around the bones of what that really means for us. And so I hope that blessed you last week. This week I'm going to talk to you about a very uh, interesting topic and one that matters to us a whole lot around here, and that is worship in freedom. And I need you to look into two places real quick in your Bibles. Just put your hands there. We're going to reference those places as the day goes on. And I need you in Acts chapter 16. Many of you love that scripture, and it'll be very familiar to, to a lot of you that have been in the Word for some time. In Matthew chapter 19, Acts 16 and Matthew chapter 19. So I got to have you go to Acts 16. I'm not going to start with a crazy funny story. I got to get right to it because God's really going to navigate this. He's going to bless your heart. Um, I, I just have to be real honest and upfront transparent about this. While I was praying and, and preparing for this message, God specifically put a word in my heart for us today. You know, I, I come up here and I communicate and I communicate for, for change, right? I'm not in this thing to just communicate dialogue to you. Uh, I want to see transformation take place. And when God specifically drops these things in my heart, I want you to know about it. And, and it'll be evident to you by the time we're done with this today. In Acts chapter 16, I want you to start in verse 16. This is the story of Paul and Silas. Very, very uh, powerful men of God throughout Scripture. And they're going about ministry and establishing the church. There was a specific time in these two men's lives that they were walking together and there was a young lady who was demon-possessed and she was agitating them. And this, we're going to read it about it in just a second. And they were going to pray. And, and this, this young lady was, was shouting out obnoxiously, basically, listen to what these men have to say. These men are men of God. Follow, they're here to tell us to follow the way and this, this, and that. So what, they, what the, the young lady was saying wasn't not true, but the way she was saying it, it was just... It just didn't fit. The first thing that I want you to understand in verse 16, it says, once when we were going to a place of prayer, then this thing happened. I, I really think somebody in this place needs to understand that when you make a commitment like today, before you leave, you're going to be like, I really want to, I want to be more available to God. I really want my life in worship to be freedom. I really want these things, right? So when you, when you change the course or the direction of your life to line it up more with what God has for you, I, it, it's like without a doubt. Let the scripture show you without a doubt there's gonna be an agitation in your life. There's gonna be a fret, and it's not your spouse. Do not do that. It, it's, it's not gonna be someone like that, but, but you gotta understand this is a spiritual kind of thing. And when you align yourself to the things that matter to God, it is gonna disrupt the ways of this world in your life. And the world's real stingy. The world wants your attention in a lot of different ways. Expect there to be conflict. Expect there to be friction. Are you hearing me? Expect there to be obstacles that by faith you need to move through to fulfill your commitment to the Lord. Because it's inevitable. If you've ever made a commitment to God, you know the next day. Probably some of you today are going to be like on fire for God. And you're going to leave and someone's going to cut you off. And immediately, you're going to be mad at the world, you know? Do you know what I just did at the altar? How dare you cut me off, you know? And you need to start, anyways, it's Houston. That's what we do. Paul gets fed up with this young lady, and, and he calls it out. He rebukes the demon in her, and the demon leaves. This is all set up for where we're going in chapter 16. The problem was, she kind of had this fortune-telling gift. And in a small town, when you got somebody that can tell the future, and, and business people want to know, they want to make investments that, are, that are, have future value that no one else understands about, right? They want a, a front line, a position in the front line there. And so what happened was when, when, when Paul rebuked this young lady, she lost her gift and it turned that town upside down. They went at him, like maliciously went at him, drug him in to the courts. And the story is going to kind of start here in, in verse 22 together. So let's just read this together in verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and you know why now. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. That is not a good day. Verse 23. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. 
When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. If you'd like to highlight anything, that word inner, that's going to be a very, very important note that we're going to come back to. Can I just tell you this? When our enemy comes at us, and you know you have an enemy, right? It's very clear in describing in the scripture that we have an enemy. His his name is Satan or Lucifer. He operates as the devil on this earth, and he does have a measure of power because he's the prince of the air, but he doesn't have all power. That's that reserves is for God. But we also understand that that he has a measure of that and, and and it can be frustrating. And many, many times, strongholds, chains, if you will, these things the Bible says so easily beset us, that's like King James for the sin in our life, right? Just can tie us up and restrict us. If you think of it, I want you to write it down. Chains are temporary confinements, all right? They're temporary confinements. And we're going to describe what a chain is and how, how powerful a chain can be. But the idea here is that when you're bound, it's more than a physical restriction, especially when you're a believer, because the jailer didn't take Paul and Silas to the outside jail cell where there was a view and they could just sit there and talk to people going by. He chose the inner cell. If you think about it, the enemy, when you're bound, he's, you know, the chains are one thing. They could have been chained outside and it would have been effective, but psychologically and emotionally, they wanted to take Paul and Silas to a place that even if they did think they could break loose, there was no way they were going to get past the guard after guard after guard and door after door after door. Strongholds can feel that way. They can, you know, even the smallest kind of stronghold, the enemy wants to psychologically and emotionally destroy your hope. He comes to kill and to steal all that is good. And, and, and so I want you to understand that this is a clear picture of strongholds, and I'm just here to celebrate what God is going to do in some of your lives today, because some of you came in and you're excited to be here, and you're normal looking and normal dressed, but you're on the inside you're bound, and you're chained up with a lot of life's issues. And today I want to show you something that, yeah, emotionally and psychologically you don't feel like you can get out. And on your own, you're not going to be able to. But there is a God, and and he is sovereign. And when he shows up, we're going to see through the scripture what he's capable of doing. Now, here's a quote for you. You might shake the chains off, but you'll never leave this place. That is what your enemy wants to tell you in your ear, in your spirit, man. He wants to sit there and remind you of all the the wrong that you've done and and why those chains are there and how restrictive they are and how hard it's going to be for you to get out. I just need to tell you this. He is a liar, and he is the father of all lies. He never said, with me all things are possible. He just says, with me, I'll remind you of everything you've ever done bad, and I can, I can, suppress, I can oppress you in that. Well, in Acts chapter 16, let's pick back up in verse 25. We know Paul and Silas are beaten. We know they're thrown into chains, and they're put in the inner cell. Verse 25, at midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And where's David Calderon? Is he here? That's why we have to learn some hymns every now and again, because this is good stuff. (laughs) And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, in verse 26, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken at once. All the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Awesome story. We all like to go into that story and say, man, these guys had it going on, right? They worship God. It's, and when, when you worship God and God shows up, man, the chains fall off, the doors are, are busted wide open. But how do we usually react in these moments? I mean, we don't really get the dialogue in their head leading up to that moment. <laughs> it was painful. It was humiliating. It was frustrating. Men of God, you know, they're doing what God's told them to do. They were on the business of God, and yet they were thrown into a prison, not just an outer cell, but an inner cell, beaten, naked, hurting. A lot of times we give up. We're frustrated, don't we? We stop fighting. We stop believing. We stop believing the words that Jesus said, with me all things are possible, right? Remain in me, and I'll remain in you, right? And I'm the one that's already overcome the world. We say things around here like we don't see you know, through the lenses, uh, we, don't, we don't look for victory. We look through the lenses of victory because in Christ we are overcomers, right? Well, he's, he's lifted us and placed us with him in heavenly, you know, places. I mean, there's just so much that we can lean into. But man, when, when we're beaten and chained and thrown into jail like this, it's hard to see anything good. In fact, Jesus taught to those that basically would listen, um, 
this idea. Our limitations basically are motivation for supernatural results. Those are big words. Let me just break it down a little bit more. And we'll get into Matthew 19. In other words, difficulty is the breeding ground for your miracle. Have you ever thought about that? We don't want difficulty in our life. We want it to be easy. We want to make all the right choices when we need to make those choices. But trust me, how many know, if you've been in this long enough, the hardest decisions, the toughest roads have yielded the greatest miracle of God in your life? Without those, you wouldn't have necessarily needed that supernatural you know, touch of God. You had it. You were in control. In Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to read some scripture here if that's all right. Just get in your, your Bibles in, in, in verse 16. It says, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked. So Jesus is walking. He's got his disciples with him. And, some, and, and here comes a guy. And he's asking him a question. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And that's a question we all have probably asked from time to time. What must I do? Because everything in this life is a result of what I did or I didn't do, right? Very seldom do things come to us when we don't do something. All right? And that's just a, a rational question. Verse 17. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. And if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Verse 18. Which ones? He inquired again. What must I do? Jesus replied. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness and testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 20. All of these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? 21. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. There's been a lot of discussion. What's the eye of a needle? Well, if you like to sew that eye on that needle, just think about a camel going through that, right? If you want to know culturally, it was like they had big gates where livestock could go through and small gates for people. And the small gate was the eye of the needle and camels have, it would be impossible for a camel to come through what a, a small door like a human could come through. So that's what Jesus is saying. With man, it's impossible, Right? When the disciples heard this, verse 25, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them, and this is the thing. With man, this is impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. I was in Vietnam a couple years ago in, in uh, Vietnam. It was beautiful, uh, honestly. Um, it was the last part of a mission kind of journey that I was on. And I was tired. I had my cargo pants on and my T-shirt, my little man purse, you know, and my, my glasses right here. I was tired. We'd been driving for hours and hours and hours. And I heard the front of the, the van. Somebody said, hey, do we have time to stop at the college? I really want you guys to meet our students. We have a college there, not our church in specific, but our fellowship has one. Um, and and the, the purpose of that college is to try to get people from areas that have unreached people groups, okay, and train them up in the ways of the Lord and maybe even train them to be pastors to go back as missionary pastors to plant churches in areas we don't have any influence, none, okay? Anyways, I, 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 I was tired. You know, humanity, I was tired. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten for a while because I don't like to eat when I'm traveling like that. I saw what it was we were eating and wasn't going to do that. And honestly, I just wanted them to take a right and not a left so I could go back to the hotel, take a shower, take a nap, and I could go on to the next place. But God directed us to the left. And we went down a little alley, and I really didn't think much of it, but there was like a four or five story. You know, it's, it's kind of French built. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's, it's beautiful. It's unbelievable. But the French kind of designed everything. It looks like Paris, I guess, is what it's compared to. These little roads, they don't have garages, you know, it's just... Really tall uh, buildings, really skinny buildings, and there's just it, real estate is, is a, a commodity. We go around the corner into this back alley, and there was a gate that opened up. And the doors on the van were down. It was hot. And I could hear people singing from the van. 
And I thought, well, that's interesting because this particular place we're at, we have to be very, you know, kind of secretive. You can't talk much about what you're doing. You're talking in code. You can't go on the Internet. Every, there's eyes everywhere looking at you. And, and there, our, our people are highly persecuted. Even though it's an open country now, praise God, it's, it's still highly. In, in fact, the church, the house church we left, military came and they harassed them because we were there making noise. So we knew for this to be happening, it had to be extraordinary. The singing. So we pulled in. We go upstairs. And here, here's the short of the story. It was our college. And at the top floor, not outside, with all the doors shut and all the windows shut, there was 20 plus students up there ranging from like 18 to probably 30 years old. I have never heard singing with such passion in my life. We walked in and their veins were popping out and their tears were just falling down their face. And they were singing things like, we would sing back in like the 70s and 80s. So I recognized the tune of some of what they were singing. Even Amazing Grace, we heard that. You know, I heard you know, some of the other songs that, that you might have recognized in church growing up, but they were singing it. So I immediately the tune connected me to their heart and their worship. And the dean came up to me. I had no idea their past. I didn't know where they were from. I had no idea that they represented unreached people groups. And the dean goes, uh, would you like to give us a word? This is our... Our seniors, whatever class, about to graduate, we're about to give them a one-way ticket back to plant a church. If it's successful, we'll invite them back to finish their degree. If it's not, then God wasn't in it. How about that for a, you know, a scholarship? Like, whoa. Like, okay. And so then they're like, oh, they're praising God because they, they got one shot at this. And the dean goes, I want you to speak to us. We're studying worship. Give us a word. <laughs> and I was like... I'm in cargoes. I was wanting to go to the hotel, and you're wanting me to share a message on worship. And God just right then got a hold of my heart. And the dean goes, would you like a Bible? It's in Vietnamese. I said, no thanks. You're killing me. I need something in English. <laughs> and, and, and basically, out of the recesses of my heart, God spoke. And he took me to Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas were in prison, and they were bound by chains. And in their moment of despair, they chose to do something extraordinary. The miraculous was in God's hand, but they chose to still remain faithful when nothing else around them would have supported that. And what I didn't realize is after I spoke, I went around and asked everybody, you know, their story. And many of them were just the smallest and the weakest looking little people you could think of. They're all like this big, and they're champions for God. Some will be martyrs, some will go back, won't be successful, some will be ultra successful. But the fact was, God spoke to me that day, and in their worship, the only thing I could tell them was, what I heard down the street is what's going to break the chains that you'll eventually find yourself in. Expect that when you leave here, people won't want you there. Because that's the world, and God is coming to shake the foundations of this world, and he's going to use you. So don't forget this moment, the moment that brought all of us white people from the Western world to tears when we walked in, the moment when we heard you down the street worshiping in a concrete building. I don't know how we could hear you all the way down there, but that worship can't stop. That worship has to be the same worship because some of you are going to find persecution in your worship. God is going to show up, and he's going to do exactly what he did for, the, for, for our great heroes of the faith. He's going to do for you. So I want to get back into Acts chapter 16, verse 25. At midnight, it says, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Continue reading. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. <laughs> the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, here it is, what must I do to be saved? That word suddenly, I, this is where God just rocked me this, this week when I was studying this for today. That word suddenly, when Paul and Silas began to, to worship God, we know that the chains fell off. Well, that was the temporary confinement. Remember, strongholds are temporary confinement. But a stronghold is only as strong as the foundation it's connected to. And the enemy wants you to believe that your stronghold has you so far in the inner places of that 
facility of your sin or that place like Paul and Silas, they weren't on the outside, they were put in the inner cell. The enemy wants you to think you're so far locked inside that even the temporary confinements, if you were to get loose of them, wouldn't matter because there's no way you can get out the foundations too strong. When God showed up, what happened? He said he started with the foundation of that stronghold. And when God shows up and busts up, shakes up, if you will, the foundation of this world system and whatever you're in, then the temporary confinements begin to fall off. Then the doors begin to open wide. Then the ones that were standing out there that were your worst critics turn and say, what must I do to be saved? That's the story. If you were to fast forward, it got better in my heart. I'm sitting there going, man, that's awesome. But what are the other places where God shows up in worship, right? And, and, and things are shaken. Well, do you remember when Jesus was on the cross and he gave up his spirit, right? He says, nevertheless, it's not my will, but yours, God. And he, he does this act of grace and mercy for us. In that moment, what happens? A great earthquake shook the foundations of the earth. The, the curtain went in two, right? Tombs were opened up. It's a crazy scripture. There were people that came out of those tombs and you know, entered into the city and then God took them up. What, what does that say? In the presence of God, right, the foundations of this world system begin to break up and those that were bound are loosed in the presence of God, in obedience to the will of God. Later on in Acts chapter 4, verse 34, we know in the second chapter of Acts, there's this thing called Pentecost and the Holy Spirit fills the place, right? And that's awesome. But then after that, like thousands of people are starting to come into the kingdom of God because now our witness is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you see and can follow even Paul and, and, and what Peter does in Acts chapter 4, verse uh, 31, it says, and they prayed. The place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with words of God boldly. That thing again, when God's presence shows up, the place was shaken. All of those misbeliefs, all of those lies, all of the world systems, all of the foundations that were just too strong, religion and all of that, look at it that way, were shaken. And the Holy Spirit began to have the freedom in their lives to speak to them and free them. They became followers of Christ that day. Guys, our true worship, literally, if it were an equation, equals freedom. Because he that the sun sets free, the Bible says is very clear what? It's free. So Paul and Silas chose to worship through. If you like to write things down, write this down. They chose to worship through. You've heard it. I'm going to pray through, right? Gonna, well, you got to worship through. Worship declares your lordship, right? Worship is more than a declaration. It's like your, your declaration in action, your heart is now allowing God lordship in your life. Paul and Silas chose to worship through. And many times, we're more than willing to worship to, but few are willing to worship through. Many of our cases, yours truly included, I'm, 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 I love worshiping. And I worship right up to that moment. And then I, 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 all of a sudden... I'll take the chains and I'll take whatever and I'll, I'll need grace. When if I just could worship one more step, I would actually begin the process of worshiping through my circumstance, worshiping through that lie of the enemy, worshiping through that stronghold. And it's because of who I'm in, not because of what I can do, but it's because of who I am worshiping and because of who I'm in that this is made possible. It was in their worship that God responded supernaturally. And not only the chains were broken, but the foundation, that's the deal, the foundation that the chains were, were, were connected to were broken up. Write this down. A stronghold is only as strong as its foundation. Our chains represent our temporary confinement. The foundation, listen to this, represents past, present, and future. As the chains are only as strong as the foundation they're attached to. And God spoke to my heart literally, and he told me to explain it to you this way, that he not only releases the prisoner from the temporary chains of this world, but he disrupts the foundations of this world. Every time you see in scripture where the voice of God shows up, what happens? It's heard like thunder. The ground is shaken. An earthquake is felt. Why? Do you think he just needs a dramatic entrance? <laughs> no. It's because when he speaks, when he shows up, it shakes the foundations of this earth. 
And, and you know, everything here is temporary, right? Everything here can be shaken. Scripture says everything in your life you think that is stable can be shaken today. Your money, your relationships, your fancy car, your house, your this, your that. It could be here today, gone tomorrow. You can't take it with you. The only thing that's a sure foundation, the only thing that if you build on, it won't disappoint, it's Jesus. I need you to stand with me. I, I think you're, you're wrapping your heart around what I'm trying to get us to. Today's going to mark a day in which destiny is going to be created, shifted, whatever, in some of your lives. You, you love to be in church. There's no doubt. You wouldn't be here if you didn't love this. Your friends, how you feel, connecting with God. But there's so much more than that. Because when you leave here, you've got like six and three-quarter days to kind of cope, if you will. Exist. Make it. That's not the life that you were created for. You were created to be an overcomer. You were created to be the one that walks with purpose. So that where you go, so life goes. Every entrance you make brings light to a dark place. Salt, as the Bible would say. So let me ask you a question. Are you free today? We have freedom ministry. We have components of our ministry that can help you with day to day. But here's just a straight gut level question. Even as a believer... If you entertain things of this world, you're opening a door to the systems of this world. And if you leave that door open long enough, as I'm explaining to everybody on Wednesday night in our spiritual warfare series, the enemy doesn't have legal right to you. But if you open the door, he sees it as permission to come in. Okay? I don't like mosquitoes. Don't like them at all. (laughs) But I can't get mad at the mosquitoes for being in my house. Because they only came in when I opened the door. Some of you need to close some doors today. And you need to worship not just to the moment, but through. And in worshiping through, you're going to find not just the chains of that temporary restriction loosening up, coming off, but you're going to find the foundations that held that, that convinced you that there's no way out, shaken and can I just one one more thing we didn't go into but let me just give you this before we pray that your enemy although he has a measure of authority I need to define the authority he has for you so that you understand if you're a believer Jesus is a part of your life you are the redeemed okay here's the fact Satan is not equal with God Satan's rule as the prince of this earth, the prince of the air, although he has a measure of authority by way of his position, he rules the lower regions, earth things, the world systems. If you've been in those, you understand. He's got some control in that. Okay, That's why when he was talking to Jesus, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, I know this is Bible trivia, but just listen, he got to tempt Jesus and he said, I'll give you anything you want, just tell me. I have permission to give it to whoever I want. Jesus didn't argue with him with that. Because he knew he has a little bit of authority. But what Jesus said is, no, 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 no. I'm not going to tempt God. I'm only going to follow what the Lord says. So Jesus is actually elevated according to God. Okay? And seated with him in heavenly places are those that he loves, the redeemed. So in a very literal sense, you're not even on the same plane as the enemy. He's here, and you're here. So let me make a few more statements. Here are some facts for the redeemed. You don't need to pray to be released from the enemy's grip because the day you were purchased, bought by the blood of Jesus, that's the day the curse was lifted and you were brought into a new kingdom and became co-heirs as sons and daughters. You don't need to say, God, loose me from these things. 
you just need to say, God, I'm going to follow and walk with you and these chains and these things fall off because you're the foundation that I'm going to lean on and not the world system. <laughs> Close the door. Close the door today by faith. Do it. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your family. You owe it to God for what he's done for you. As a believer, close the door today. Stop going in those directions. And now walk in the direction that he's calling you to as the redeemed. Know the position you have. If you need to be set free, in just a moment, we're going to pray. And my only invitation to you is worship. The scripture says very clearly that God shows up in our worship. The scripture says he inhabits the praise of his people. He's going to show up, all right? And in that presence, right, there's fullness of joy. So it's going to turn the frowns that came in upside down, and we're going to start smiling a little more because the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. If you don't have strength, you'll believe the chains that you're in are, are, are more than enough to keep you bound. You'll believe the foundation is too strong to let the chains go if you don't have joy. Because then you don't have strength. You don't even know who you're with. But you're not alone. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so in just a minute, when you respond in your worship, I, I want you to believe, believe, believe that when you begin to pray, the foundations, don't even think about the change. Let the foundations be shaken in your life. And then let those other things that, that tie themselves to us respond to what God is doing, not what you're doing, what God is doing in your life. That will change everything for us. Bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We know you've clearly laid this out. We know that when we worship you, in your response, the world systems are shaken. The foundations that have been lying to us for so long that we can't get out of this uh, will be shaken. And those chains, those things we literally see, God, will have to respond not in what we've done, but in what you've done through our worship. What an incredible picture of what you're about to do in freeing those that you love. If you're here today, before we begin this prayer, and today is the day that you're like, man, I, I want to pray, and I want God to respond in my life in that way. Jesus responds to those that, 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 that turn their heart to him. And that's just his system. That's his way. You have to accept him in, into your life. Otherwise, you walk out of here, and, and the ruler of this world, is gonna, he has access to you. Those that are believers... Have, are completely covered by the blood of Jesus. Those that are not believers, they are left to the world and to the world systems. That's how the scripture describes it. Here today, and you, you're like, well, I'm not going back out there like that. Jesus needs to be a part of my life. So I, I'm interested, even if I don't fully understand, to just simply ask a few questions and explore the idea, or I have got to give my heart to Jesus. I want you to lift your hand right now and say, Pastor, pray that prayer with me. I want to know who Jesus is. Just lift your hand right where you're at and say, this, this is my day. i got to know who Jesus is. I'm not leaving the same person I came in. Lift it really high. We worship the God here, and uh, we, we lift our hands, so sometimes it's hard for me to tell. Praise God. There are several hands that are up. And we celebrate as a family for that. And we pray together, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me and seeing in me what I could not see for myself. Please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Restore me. I will follow you and serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen.